Okay, we'll get started. Hello, everyone, I, and thank you for joining us uh, for our fourth chapter of the AIA California Climate Action webinar series. I'm Don Kasky, FAIA, California's Vice President of Education and Professional Development. We know that time, uh, that the times that we're in are strange and difficult, and we really appreciate you taking this hour to consider the climate during the chaos right now. We want to remind you that there are resources for you on the AIA California website under COVID-19 resources tab. These resources are being updated daily, uh, including legislative updates by AIA California Government Relations Director, Mark Christian. As always, additional resources will be added as they arise. In addition to many of your local chapters hosting member town halls, AIA California will be hosting another town hall on Tuesday, April 28th at 12 p.m. Registration information was included in yesterday's ed edition of Relevance and is also included on the AIA California website. Now on to uh, today's webinar. First of all, our Climate Action webinar series wouldn't be made possible without the support of our partners. Today's webinar is sponsored by Solar Skyrise. Solar Skyrise is a newer design tool for architects that makes it possible to analyze the energy potential and business case for solar on all surfaces of a building with just one click. Their technology helps design, sustain, the design for sustainability and resilience and get closer to the 2030 goal of net zero energy architecture. So thank you to Solar Skyrise for partnering with AIA California on our climate action initiatives. Today's webinar is the fourth chapter of the AIA California Climate Action webinar series. If you missed the first three web webinars or any one of them, be sure to check out the climate action portion of the AIA California website for the recordings side decks, and additional helpful resources. As you know, this webinar series is centered around each of the pillars of the AIA National Framework for Design Excellence. Design is not just about aesthetic components, but how buildings perform for people. The framework for the design excellence is made up of 10 measures, formerly known as the COAT Top 10. It organizes our thinking, facilitates conversations with our clients and communities we serve, and sets meaningful goals and targets for climate action. Today's webinar focuses on design, designing for energy. When using this lens while looking at your next project, think about energy benchmarking and goal setting, passive design features, climate responsive design, energy modeling, on-site renewables, solar and wind, for instance, net zero energy, net zero carbon building, and commissioning. So during the uh, seminar, we want you to know how do you can ask questions using the Q&A box in the lower or upper part of your Zoom window. Feel free to type in questions for STET to answer during the question and answer portion at the end of the webinar. So moving on to uh, our, our speaker's uh, biography today, our speaker is Stet Sanborn, AIA, an award-winning designer with a background in both engineering and architecture. Stet serves as a principal and engineering discipline leader in Smith Group San Francisco office. He specializes in net zero energy and net zero carbon design. Stet is a leading voice in statewide decarbonization efforts and building electrification. Recently supporting the City of Berkeley's Natural Gas Ban Ordinance, community outreach workshops, and, and currently sitting on San Francisco Mayor's Task Force on Decarbonization. STET leads efforts to incorporate high-performance building enclosures, passive design strategies, advanced HVAC, and grid-connected renewable energy microgrid systems into a wide range of build types in pursuit of rapid decarbonization. Stett earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from Kettering University, University 
and Master of Architecture from the University of California, Berkeley. He is currently a guest a faculty member at UC Berkeley teaching a course on energy and building science and frequently serves as a member of the technical advisory committees for the California Energy Commission. Epic Grant Research Projects, the, the California Energy Commission Epic Grant Research Projects, focused on net zero energy design. Stead is currently a co-author of the upcoming ASHRAE Advanced Energy Design Guide for Zero Energy Build Multifamily Buildings, and also served as an adjunct professor of the architecture at of, of architecture at the California College of the Arts. Design courses in building systems, sustainable, sustainable design, and integrated building design. So with that, Stet, and I can see the trees behind you. He's yeah. <laughs> hiding in the forest somewhere. I'm going to turn it over to you. Super. Thank you, Don, um, for the great introduction. And welcome, everybody. Um, Really quickly, I was just gonna flash up some of the learning objectives. I'll get to the agenda uh, really quickly, um, and I promise to leave time for uh, Q&A, as I imagine there'll be um, quite a few questions that come up. Um, so today, really focusing on sort of the design process, um, how energy modeling and energy-focused design kind of folds into that, um, but also sort of setting the context uh, for how we design in sort of this low-carbon uh, future. Um, which is hopefully today <laughs> uh, and not too far out. Um, so generally the, um, today I'm gonna sort of ground us in a little bit of discussion of where our climate policy is uh, right this moment um, and some of the rapid changes that have been happening um, over the last couple of months, um, both at the state level, um, but also a big focus on some local level um, policy changes that have happened throughout California. Um, I'm gonna talk about our design process how we integrate tools in and where we integrate those tools into the process uh, for a focus both on energy, uh, daylight, comfort, um, and I'll touch a little bit on embodied carbon as well. Um, we really see that all of those things as an integral piece of designing for energy or designing for low energy. Um, I'll do a quick um, sort of recap of where California's energy grid um, is right now and how that actually impacts the way that we model and design. Um, and then uh, the tail end uh, focus a little bit on um, designing for resilience um, in this sort of energy context, um, both from a changing climate standpoint, um, but also some tools that we are using um, to, to focus on some microgrid uh, work. Um, so I'll go through this really quickly because I want to have quite a bit of time uh, for Q&A, but um, a lot of what we're dealing with in the state uh, from a policy standpoint is really driven by um, uh, two executive orders, uh, one Senate bill and one executive order, um, sort of driving our state towards uh, uh, carbon neutrality goals. Um, so the first one, um, SB 100, is really focused on our utility grid and getting our electrical grid uh, to be carbon neutral by 2045. Um, and then the executive order uh, that shortly followed that um, on actually trying to transition our entire economy to carbon neutrality. Um, so really ambitious goals. Um, and that kind of lit a, a little bit of fire um, uh, at, on the state side, but more so it actually lit a little bit of fire um, at the local government um, side. So as Don mentioned, um, I've been supporting a number of the cities um, up here in the Bay Area um, as they uh, adopt reach codes. So I've been invo involved in code and policy stuff uh, with the California Energy Commission for a number of years, um, but most locally helping cities actually adopt more aggressive codes, so what we call reach codes. Uh, so energy codes uh, that are only uh, applied to their jurisdiction, but go above and beyond the state code. Um, and these actually include um, codes most recently of um, either disincentivizing the use of natural gas or banning it altogether as the case was in, in Berkeley uh, this fall. Um, so as of December, I think we had around 20 cities that had enacted uh, reach codes. They've recently all been approved by the California Energy Commission, so they're allowed to go above and beyond. Um, and as of this month, um, it's up to 30 cities. So there's a tremendous wave uh, going throughout the state of California right now of individual cities saying, you know what, this carbon crisis is actually, uh, climate crisis is actually a bigger deal um, and we wanna be more aggressive. Um, so a lot of cities are adopting um, 
uh, reach codes who were requiring 10% more efficient buildings over the baseline code, or in a lot of cases, um, gas bans with um, the alternative um, being reach codes, where if you choose to use gas, then your building has to be even more efficient. Um, so a lot of movement on here, it's, it's actually happening quite quickly, um, and cities are starting to support each other in this effort. So actually, if you want my crystal ball prediction, um, I think the state is gonna be um, actually driven by local uh, cities to be even more aggressive uh, than they already are. A lot of that uh, policy work um, is actually grounded in recent research that's been coming out um, around the dangers of natural gas and the actual climate impacts from it. So, you know, for all of us who have been doing this for a while, we all worked really hard, I'd say about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, to transition all of our buildings to high efficiency, um, you know, boilers and condensing um, furnaces and sort of condensing appliances or the, the ultimate efficiency within um, gas fired appliance world. We're now seeing that um, the infrastructure itself is not really supportive of um, that low carbon future, both the emissions associated with burning natural gas, but also at the leakage rates. So these are just some images of um, some Google uh, vehicles, the ones doing the mapping, uh, that were actually outfitted with methane sensors. And so they were driving around um, looking actually for methane leaks as they were doing the mapping of the site. And so you start to see spikes where the infrastructure has failed, um, either leaks in piping um, or more dangerously at um, locations where folks work. Um, in processing plants where uh, methane plumes exist. And you know anyone who remembers uh, San Bruno and some other um, gas explosions knows the dangers of concentrated natural gas and methane, uh, especially on leaks. So all of this sort of provides this really immediate need uh, for us to be much more aggressive um, in how we design um, our buildings. On the positive side, so as we're looking at sort of the dangers of climate change, the dangers of um, of natural gas. On the positive side, our grid is rapidly changing to renewable power. Um, so this is um, data just pulled off of the California ISO. Um, but you can see in the, in the graph on the left, we're aggressively going to um, much lower carbon energy sources. So th that's real-time carbon uh, metrics from our utility grid. Um, in general, um, California um, is somewhere around 37% now, uh, 36 to 37% renewable power. Um, over the course of a year, and the majority of that coming from um, solar. And I'll talk a little bit about what the impacts of that are um, on the way that we design buildings for low energy. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how modeling sort of fits into this whole design process. And this, there's probably a million diagrams that are similar to this. This is the one that we use um, in our own office. Um, of trying to make sure that we solidify uh, the sustainability and energy goals at the core of the project. And then it gives us a pathway to figure out how to overlay certain tools into that design process. So starting with pre-design all the way through um, post-occupancy evaluation studies that we also do um, quite actively. Um, so at each of these stages, we are trying to make sure that we have set our goals. Um, how is this project gonna fit within the 2030 uh, requirements? Um, how are we, uh, how close to net zero are we going to uh, be? And it gives us a chance to pick which tool can help us answer which question. So whenever we're talking about energy modeling, we're always trying to, rather than pick a, pick a tool first, uh, we're actually trying to start with a question. What is the question for that phase? Um, and then which tool is appropriate to answer it? Um, I think there's, often there's a, a rush towards grabbing the sexiest new energy modeling tool or scripting um, software, um, and then just running lots of simulations. Um, but we really feel like you need to start with a question, <laughs> start asking what you're trying to um, figure out, and then pick the tool that's most appropriate actually answering that question. So when we start to think about questions, um, sort of the image on the right is um, how we uh, sort of start framing what those questions could be. So they could be something about early goal setting, benchmarking. Um, Don mentioned, um, you know, it's really important for a project to figure out where your project's going to sit within the greater scheme. So whether you're pulling from um, uh, CBEC data or if you're pulling from AIA 2030 um, it's, or Energy Star, it's really important to sort of lay the groundwork of how your building is going to fit into uh, that larger setting of, of similar building types. 
Um, obviously, early on, we're looking at shape, massing of the building orientation. We're trying to do um, some really early stage modeling, again, to set where our energy use intensity might lie um, how, and how close we are to net zero. The middle section of this graph is actually kind of showing the fun stuff, at least the, the stuff that I really enjoy uh, working on with my team. Um, and that's doing some um, sort of parametric modeling, teasing out some details as the massing sort of takes shape. We start to um, look at specific shading um, strategies and peak load reductions. Um, I think one of the benefits of being a, a large integrated design firm is, you know, I run our engineering team I'm, and our team is sitting right next to the architects on the same projects. And so as sort of the building develops, we're looking at what um, peak loads might be because that drives our um, heating and cooling system sizing. So can we get those low enough to get rid of systems? Um, those decisions were very heavily involved early in design. As we get through the, the project, um, there's different um, systems options that we're gonna be looking at comparing um, you know, energy, comparing um, the benefits of economizers, all the, all the fun things that the engineering side likes to do, but how does that impact the architecture? And there's a really strong benefit to be able to do those things at the, time, at the same time. Um, obviously, we also are doing co-compliance, the least sexy part of our projects, um, but something that is really important in terms of how that fits into the design uh, process and what tools you use for that. Um, so this is a little bit of, um, and I'll go through a list of sort of all the tools that um, I think are really valuable out there, but this is a, a diagram that we use um, in, in our office. Um, so before the project even starts, um, we have um, sort of mandatory climate analysis. We've developed our own tools um, in-house to do this, to pull weather data um, and look for optimization strategies, but there are some really actually great tools out there um, that are free. So Climate Consultant was developed at UCLA um, by the Great Building Science Group there. Um, it's a free tool, can really give you a chance to look at your building um, before you have a building and look at the site and understand what opportunities you might have. Again, this is, it'll help you with shading selections. It'll help you with um, sort of wind speed, wind direction, seasonal wind, um, and, and even give you an idea on a psychometric chart about what portions of the year you could get by with thermal mass or some of our other sort of like really core passive strategies that we like. We then push into what we call our building performance analysis plan. Um, so each project gets one of these. Um, where we itemize out sort of the strategies um, and the types of modeling that we think would be most effective for that project. Um, so is it a hospital? Well, a hospital is heavily process load driven, ventilation load driven, and cooling driven. So the modeling that we might do um, would be different than if we we're doing a K through 12 school, um, a higher ed building, or an office building, uh, say down in Menlo Park. So building types um, have uh, very different um, um, goals. Uh, we're usually doing this in collaboration along with the um, building um, owner's requirements um, or the OPR. Um, we are trying, these, these things are sort of done in parallel um, and sort of as an iterative process. Um, we then sort of as the project moves on, um, we're um, picking which tools actually help satisfy those questions that we were asking or those um, areas that we wanted to focus on. Um, and that can range from super early concept modeling in Sapphira. Um, we happen to typically use IES VE and IES um, core, and then we do a lot of scripting um, and Dynamo work within sort of the Rhino, Grasshopper, um, Honeybee um, sort of sphere of products. Um, that sort of takes us into our concept world um, where we're developing uh, these massings, and then we move um, in parallel, we're also then going to some of our more advanced engineering tools that we actually use to size systems. Um, so a lot of open studio work, um, Energy Plus based engine uh, modeling, we still use IES, um, sometimes eQuest. Um, ultimately, that is, uh, we use the, a lot of those tools to actually get us through compliance modeling as well. If ever possible, we would we love to try to um, use our analysis tools to carry us through compliance. Um, so documentation for lead, documentation for, um, uh, for Title 24 Part 6, um, et cetera. Um, and then we also, at the very end of projects, um, are off doing POEs. So we partner with the UC Berkeley Center for the Built Environment quite a bit on doing post-occupancy evaluations of our projects, to, um, again, to try to learn 
um, from our own um, strengths and weaknesses. So the list on the left, um, I want to be pretty tool agnostic um, because I don't think you could um, you could probably fit all the tools onto one page <laughs> of all the um, options out there. Um, so we have tools. Um, I already mentioned IES, Open Studio, which is a free front end for um, Energy Plus, uh, Design Builder, Sapphira, uh, Climate Studio, uh, Energy Pro, um, a whole host of them. There's a lot of modeling tools and each of them have strengths um, in helping you actually get to zero energy. Um, some of them are easier to use than others, but may not be as robust um, on the back end. Um, so it's kind of a, um, a test case um, for smaller firms. It's much harder, I would say, to pick um, sort of all in on a tool um, because you have far less um, overhead flexibility to actually um, have people train full time on these tools. So often relying on consultants to that work. Um, I can say that uh, sort of most recently, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, um, that's come onto the market um, out of MIT was the Climate Studio um, package, which is um, being developed by Solima, uh, which is the same company that does Diva for Rhino. Um, that is a much more comprehensive sort of um, stab at parametric modeling and all the way through compliance. So it's brand new. Um, it's just come out this year or this, this past year. Um, so I haven't, I haven't personally used it yet. We've been doing some vetting on it uh, to uh, check it out, but I just wanted to flag that as one of the more recent um, tools uh, that's hit the market that's been um, pretty compelling. So that is sort of covering energy, like the energy piece. But I think um, something that we're really concerned about is, um, and I see this in, in both my student work um, as well as in professional work when I'm um, sort of like reviewing um, uh, projects submitted for like ARC at zero, et cetera, is that um, sometimes our focus is myopic on just energy um, without considering the personal experience of folks inside our buildings, the visitors, guests, and occupants. Um, so there's a really big, it's really important to not just focus on your EUI, your energy use intensity, and, and at the exception of um, the experience inside your building. So we really um, dive heavily into daylight uh, modeling, not just for sort of the compliance tools uh, or compliance paths of daylight autonomy, but um, a big focus on comfort, occupant comfort and occupant, occupant glare um, metrics. Um, because those two things, um, if you design your building to be daylit, but it's over daylit um, and everybody pulls the shades and then the lights come back on. So now you have the penalty of having a very glassy building with the lights all the way on. And so you're not getting that energy benefit. So there's a, there's a really important piece of pulling the thread all the way through of these decisions and making sure that you're doing the modeling um, that actually will show some, some benefit. Um, so for f uh, a lot of this daylight modeling, we're using, you know, you can use Revit plugins, um, Insight 360. Uh, Sapphira has um, a, a tool looking at early daylight modeling, IES. And then there's a whole suite of tools in sort of the uh, Rhino Grasshopper uh, world. And we, and by the way, we use all of these um, depending on the project. So, um, and which team members are on the project, which ones they're most comfortable with. A lot of our younger um, architects or engineers are actually very facile in Rhino um, and scripting. Uh, so doing Dynamo scripting uh, within the sort of grasshopper world and Rhino. Um, so we um, have started to bias a little bit towards uh, that direction uh, because our younger staff um, are really excited about the opportunities there. Um, not just looking at availability, I think one of the key indices that I just want to make sure everybody is thinking about, not just daylight autonomy, but looking at useful daylight index. Um, so it's, an, it's another daylighting metric um, that looks at how, much, how many areas are actually overlit. Uh, so you can, it's the same plan diagram, but the idea is that you want to start to identify some of these perimeter spaces that you actually might be overlighting. Um, so that people can't do functional work in those spaces. Um, and so looking at both daylight autonomy and useful daylight index is a really good baseline for making sure that you'll actually get the energy savings out of your design that you intended to do. One of the other pieces um, that we think is actually incredibly important is actually is combining our energy modeling with thermal comfort modeling. Um, so there's a couple tools out there um, that actually allow us to look at 
of spatial thermal comfort. Um, so there's uh, one of them is from the Center for the Built Environment at Berkeley. It's a free online tool. You can, it's the image on the left. You can actually go in and put in your space parameters, your glass area, um, your interior set points, and you can actually get us um, be able to identify areas within your floor plate where folks may be uncomfortable. And that could be due to direct glare, uh, direct sunbeam coming into your space, um, uncomfortable air currents, uh, et cetera. So thermal comfort, again, actually can give you some opportunities on low energy system design. So um, you can actually um, offset some of that direct beam uh, impact, say with a radiant cooling system, and, and still actually have a very comfortable space, even if the air temperature is a little elevated. Um, the image on the right, as I mentioned, Climate Studio by Salema, um, which has just come out, so I haven't vetted it yet, um, but it's built off of the CBE um, algorithm, so it should be relatively robust. Um, again, doing full plate thermal comfort studies to make sure that if you are doing these very sort of transparent buildings, which um, has been the rage um, since before I was in school, um, that you're actually still taking into account the human experience um, and folks inside the building. Um, so making sure that areas aren't over um, overlit. So one of the other um, big pieces um, on the modeling side, which has gotten almost no attention until I would say probably the last three or four years, or sorry, I shouldn't say no attention, it's gotten very little attention, is looking at embodied carbon. Um, so um, if any of you guys have had the benefit of hearing um, anyone from the Carbon Leadership Forum or um, Larry Strain uh, from Siegel and Strain Architects give a talk on embodied carbon, um, you'll know that as we focus, um, especially now, as we focus on net zero energy buildings, so taking all the operational carbon out of our buildings, getting them to net zero, then all of a sudden the chunk of the pie that you have left for carbon is all in the materials and, that go into the building uh, to build it and all of the um, energy that goes into getting those materials on site. And so we are diving much heavier now uh, than we ever have in the past into doing full life cycle carbon assessments of our buildings that are focused on the embodied carbon piece. Um, so we've been uh, working with um, uh, DPR construction, for instance, um, on a number of years doing uh, their new offices. And our latest one that just opened in Sacramento uh, was, took a really hard focus on building reuse instead of new construction. Um, so taking an existing building um, and then adding on to it to meet the program um, to avoid um, building a brand new building all the way from scratch. So a huge chunk of embodied carbon avoided through reuse. Um, so I would say actually the, the biggest thing you could do if, if you want to fight um, climate change is go renovate some poor performing buildings. Um, so rather than building new, go find a poor performing building and make it amazing. And when you do it, do a deep green retrofit and make it net zero. Uh, the carbon savings will be tremendous. Um, so on the on the DPR building in Sacramento, you know all the new structure that went on um, to make the building larger to meet their program needs was all CLT cross laminated timber. Um, so one of the first ones in the state as a retrofit, um, and also I think one of the first ones to use uh, CLT as shear walls. Um, but again, the big focus is on understanding what materials are going into the building and um, what they what it takes to make those materials. Um, so a couple of the tools that are out there, uh, the newest and sort of uh, the one that's gotten the most attention in the last uh, six months um, has been the EC3 tool, uh, which was developed by the Carbon Leadership Forum up at the University of Washington. Um, and uh, Kate Simonon is the director there, phenomenal um, person, incredibly smart, um, and has really driven um, embodied carbon as something that we need to be focusing on. Um, and a lot of that work um, is built on uh, some of the other tools that have existed actually for a number of years. Uh, so Athena is probably the longest lasting tool, um, came over to, from Europe. Um, I remember when I was working for um, Larry, uh, Larry Strain, um, gosh, 15 years ago, um, he, he and I were using Athena to try to calculate embodied carbon of um, some of our small projects. It was incredibly difficult. Um, you were doing hand takeoffs of every material off of our drawings. Um, but that's really sort of migrated into um, the world of Tally and EC3, which are, uh, have the ability to actually take your Revit model and do the takeoffs. It's sort of finally harnessing some of the power that 
um, that BIM has and actually being able to harness um, the takeoff capability. So getting weights, getting lengths, getting measurements off of the building and dumping those into uh, product types and being able to um, find your EPDs um, that you can actually go in and, um, and add that, um, that component of embodied carbon into your analysis. Um, so full life cycle, it's looking at both procurement, construction, and then end of life um, for all those sort of scope three um, uh, emissions. Um, so I think the really important part in all of this, and it has changed quite a bit um, over the last, um, probably the last three or four years, um, is our focus on not just looking at efficiency um, or your EUI, um, but trying to understand when you use power. Um, so something I just want to flag is that if you look at our current carbon mix on the 2019 grid, so I haven't updated this for 2020, um, but this is looking at every hour, the carbon intensity of the grid for every hour um, for every month uh, throughout the year. So what you're going to notice is that because of all the renewables that we have that I mentioned earlier on the grid um, in California, that our middle chunk of the day and our generally spring uh, to fall is a really huge benefit from a carbon standpoint if we use power then, uh, because almost all of that power is actually coming from renewable energy. If you compare that against uh, wintertime months um, and especially in the evening um, at night hours, so um, around 9 p.m. until about 6 a.m., our carbon or our grid mix is actually pretty carbon intensive. Um, so when your building needs to use energy, um, is, um, it's, that impact is going to have sort of a double impact if it's not aligned with when the grid actually has clean power. So it's not enough for us to think about just your average grid mix. We wanna start understanding when your building uses power um, and making sure that we're trying to um, move loads to align with our low carbon portions of the grid and times of year. So a source, if, if any of you guys are interested in trying to actually understand what those incremental, the, those five minute increments or one minute increments of carbon intensity on the grid, uh, there's a company called Watt Time, um, which was um, an offshoot out of a Tally A10 and um, some really smoke, uh, smart folks. Um, they're actually able to grab that incremental carbon intensity. And you can actually purchase the data from them um, to design your buildings actually to incorporate demand response strategies. Things that we've been talking about for years to help with peak load reductions, we used to do a lot of demand response sort of strategies to try to shift load uh, from midday. But now we're actually using these strategies rather than shifting load from midday, it's actually moving load into midday when we have those low carbon hours. So hours with high renewable amounts of energy. So this is what um, the, the grid could look like um, if instead of using, this is an example of, um, of instead of using gas tankless water heaters, if we switch to heat pump water heaters, um, just as an example, which have a COP of three-ish, um, you'll notice that all of a sudden when we electrify equipment and we go to high efficiency equipment, then that carbon benefit expands quite a bit. Um, so now there's only a few hours um, of the day where it's from a carbon standpoint better to be burning gas on site than purchasing um, electricity from the grid. Um, but this goes into why reducing your loads in your building through energy modeling is exceptionally important. And then matching that with uh, technology within your building um, that's very efficient. Um, so why I'm a big proponent of all electric sort of heat pump strategies for buildings, um, heat recovery chillers, um, is because I can align those loads really well um, with a little bit of energy storage. The other big thing that we hear about on the efficiency side um, is actually sort of the sister story of resiliency. Um, and it's come up um, obviously in California, both in Southern California and, and, and NorCal, um, of all the preemptive power shutoffs uh, stemming from the wildfires. And so there's a lot of discussion on what is the what is the role of energy efficiency as it relates to sort of resiliency? And are those two things sort of mutually exclusive or how are they, how well are they integrated? Um, 
we think of them as almost the same story. Um, and when I talk a little bit in a second about our resiliency strategies um, that we use in our buildings, they're predicated on buildings that use less energy. So the resiliency strategies that I'll talk about are born out of buildings that reduce their loads. If you have an energy hog of a building, you're going to pay through the um, tooth to actually get a resiliency story. So efficiency has to be your first step, which is why all the energy modeling tools that I talked about at the beginning of getting using those to actually incrementally reduce your energy use and operations while maintaining comfort um, and a safe place at work, that's really important because that's how you get a smaller resiliency system, um, if you will. Another key piece of understanding resiliency is actually understanding climate change. Um, and so, um, I think almost all of the firm, the large firms that I know of that are doing, um, you know, really still serious resiliency work around energy efficiency um, are also um, doing future casting with weather files. Um, so if you haven't, um, there's a number of places that you can get these. Weather Shift is one of one such company um, where you can, um, you, you can essentially fill in which climate model, um, how conservative, how aggressive um, you're comfortable with. Um, but they will help map out where temperatures for any specific location are going to trend over time if the climate models um, are followed through. Um, we use this information for a couple reasons. Uh, one, something that we do in our design process now, uh, say picking insulation values um, or the amount of shading, um, those will have a different impact if we use a TMY uh, file from today, which is based on 30 years of historical data, It'll, those designs will have a different impact on that scenario versus one that we look out into the future. So uh, for instance, um, I think this is looking at Sacramento. You'll notice that you know, summertime peak temperatures, um, average peak um, is around 93 degrees currently. Well, out 50 years, 60 years, you start to see that push up into the high 90s. And that's your average highs. That doesn't account for the really high peaks, uh, which are getting even more extreme. And so it's really important uh, for architects and for engineers to be looking forward with our designs and not backwards. So we shouldn't only be relying on historical data uh, to design our HVAC systems. We should be looking out into the future uh, because we're, you know, we're trying to design these buildings to be 40 year, 50 year, 60 year, 100 year buildings. They need to be ready uh, for that future. And ultimately, do I know exactly what it's going to be? No, but it starts a conversation with our clients on what they anticipate for performance for the future. It goes back to our BPA plan and it goes back to the owner's project requirement document that we would work on with the client. Setting those goals and understanding of how your building should perform today and in 20 years and in 40 years, make sure that all of you are on the same page. And so you can make the same assumptions in your system designs, in your shading analysis, or how resilient the building um, should be. So one of the big uh, pieces that we start seeing now in our modeling efforts that has both, um, both an efficiency or um, a decarbonization story today and also a resiliency story is um, starting to look at how we interact with the grid um, and our buildings. So in terms of how we can shift load um, in our buildings, how we can squish our peaks um, and how we can better align um, the, the needs of our building with our low carbon grid. Um, so if you haven't heard of the program uh, from New Buildings Institute uh, called Grid Optimal, um, I'd highly encourage you to look into it. Um, this is a program that gives you some, actually some guidelines. Um, if you're interested in your building being a really good friend to the grid, most of the time this is gonna be impacted by buildings that have gone zero net energy um, or all electric. Um, and the idea is rather than having every building um, in the state go all electric and dump all their renewable energy excess um, in July onto the grid and cause issues. We're trying to design our buildings to be more flexible so that we can store more energy on site and deploy that energy when the grid needs it um, or when our building needs it, but not to overwhelm the grid. Um, so Grid Optimal is a framework um, that has a lot of strength in its ability to be sort of a good grid friend. And that sort of brings us to um, something that um, 
a, num a number of you are probably um, being asked about uh, from clients, especially coming out of the wildfire season uh, last year and getting ready for us to be entering it this fall. Um, and that's um, the strategy of looking at microgrids. So microgrids, um, which for those of you who aren't familiar, um, are essentially any um, sort of electrical grid, um, really at any size, but a lot that can island itself and operate on its own. So you can still be connected to the grid, but a microgrid would allow you to disconnect uh, from that utility grid. Um, if there was a, a fire, uh, for say, or, or the energy was shut down, um, or some other natural disaster. We really look at microgrids actually having more benefits though than just serving backup power. Uh, that's often what people think of them as, oh, it's just batteries, it's gonna be my backup power. They actually have a really strong role in, in what you could do when you combine PV, batteries, and load management in your building. You can actually manipulate your utility prices. <laughs> um, so the graphs on the bottom, um, for a lot of you um, in the energy efficiency world, you probably know that upwards of 40% of your client's energy bill is driven by these, this little thing called demand charge. Um, and that is the highest peak power that your client uses in any 15 minute increment over the course of a month. So they take that number, that single number for that one 15 minute increment and they charge you a lot of money for it. Well, efficiency measures throughout the building um, can be designed to flatten those off, um, but microgrids are really a strong asset if you actually want to just shave it off completely. So if you have some sort of energy storage on your site, whether it's batteries, a flywheel, thermal energy storage, uh, chilled water tanks, um, heating hot water tanks, you can actually shave a good chunk of those demand charges off and save your client several amounts of money. When I combine storage with PV and getting to net zero energy, all of a sudden I can purchase power when it's very cheap, I can sell power when it's very expensive, um, and I can self-generate on site. So all of a sudden by manipulating those demand charges, producing my own power, you can actually give your clients far more control over their utility costs. And when you combine that with efficiency measures and good design for low energy, it's kind of that sweet spot or the sort of holy grail of efficient, um, efficient design. So the idea with a microgrid is that for 99% of the year, it is there saving your client money. It is there shaping your demand curve to match the grid. It's there to shave off demand charges. Again, saving considerable money for your client. And then in the off chance that there is a natural disaster or a preemptive power shutoff from your local utility um, or some other reason that you need backup power, then the microgrid is there as well. So unlike a backup generator that just sits there and costs money, <laughs> um, a microgrid actually can have a financial benefit throughout the course of the year um, to help offset the in, uh, initial capital investment. So we use um, an, a, a, a widely available tool um, that was developed um, out of the National Renewable Energy Lab. Um, this is, it's called Homer Grid. Um, it's the second generation um, that you can, um, a second generation of software that you can get, um, but it allows you to um, optimize or size a system based on your energy loads. So once we've done our whole energy model, we have an idea of what our annual energy loads are going to be. We can import that model into Homer, and then we can start manipulating things. So we can put in the exact price and tariff structure that, um, that your client pays. So how much they pay for peak power, time of use power, demand charges, all of that. We pick the schedule. It actually has a drop down menu where you can just go right to SoCal Edison, PGE. You can pick the actual schedule that your client has um, or will have. You can put that in um, and you can start doing uh, test scenarios. How many days do you want backup power, for instance? Do you need three days of um, autonomous running? Do you need five days? Do you need two weeks? Um, Again, it goes back to that sort of OPR and the documents with our, um, uh, with our building performance plan, but what are the success criteria for the project? Um, how much backup do you need? Homer will actually help size a battery system, a battery plus cogen, battery plus diesel backup, a natural gas uh, generator, a wind power, solar. It'll let you take all these power resources into one model and find the most economical uh, version of that for your client. Um, 
They can even input interest rates that they would have to pay on a loan that they would have to take out to get the system. It'll take all that economic model uh, information and put it into the model and solve for the most economic um, microgrid solution that meets your performance criteria. Um, so in the age of resiliency, um, I would say this is actually the most powerful tool. Um, and it's the one I would say that stands above the rest um, in terms of it's actually can deliver economic information, not just carbon information. So it can give you energy and carbon um, to actually solve uh, for sort of the greater good. So I know that was um, quite the sweep of tools um, and, and some strategies, um, but I want to quick before I stop and take questions, I want to um, just put out a brief um, um, sort of praise uh, for Abipsa. Um, so if you have staff or if you're interested in energy modeling or you have staff that are super passionate, I highly encourage you to have them uh, look into Abipsa um, and the local chapters. There's pretty much one in every city and um, they are the people that love modeling tools. They love doing this stuff. Um, if you're looking for somebody to join your firm that has the skill set, um, going to an Abipsa meeting is a great place to start. Um, so with that, I think I'll open it up um, for questions. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Steph, for a great, great presentation. We'll now open the floor for some questions and answers. I already see some questions on the uh, in the question box. For any questions uh, we're that we're not able to answer today, if we run out of time, we'll provide uh, additional resource on our climate action uh, webinar site so that we get those questions answered. And just a reminder again, type any questions you might have using the Q&A box located either in the, uh, the lower or upper menu bar of your Zoom window. And I also have a couple other questions. And I am proud to tell Stet that I have a microsystem in my own house. So, and it works Perfect. really great. So why don't we open that up? There were, I noticed there were a couple of questions that came out in the chat. So let me just throw those out real quick and then we'll go to the question, and question box. Uh, one of them was, um, uh, does your BPA plan include clients' input? Yeah. Um, so for when we're doing our B BPA plan, we're usually doing it at the same time or a little bit before we're doing the owner project requirement form, the OPR. Um, mm -hmm. And so we'll do a draft of our BPA and we'll sh actually share it with our client um, because we're also using that um, to establish scope and fee. Um, we want them to know what modeling we think is really important to the project uh, to get to their goals. So you need to understand the client's goals and then they need to understand what sort of it takes, what scope it takes for us to answer those questions. And so you can't do it in isolation or else you'll throw a fee at a client and be like, oh, here's our modeling fee. And they'll be like, well, what's that for? Um, and so we, we wanna tie the modeling questions to the goals and those goals are oftentimes you know, in collaboration with the client. Okay. Another question that came up in the chat session was for a small building, would a few Tesla power walls um, work very much like a microgrid? Yep, um, so um, the Tesla power wall does have um, islanding capability. Um, it wasn't originally designed for that, um, but it certainly can. Um, you would probably need a few of them uh, for a small building. Typically, you know, if you look at their power wall, um, I think they're normally for a normal size well, I don't know if there's such a thing as a normal size house, but often uh, residential homes would need two of them um, with PV to get some sort of uh, solid resiliency um, or more. Um, one can provide backup um, for several hours, but if you're looking for sort of continual power um, right. with long-term out, um, you might need more. So yeah, the battery siding, sizing is completely tied to your load profile um, for your building. Yeah. Okay, and the last one under the chat session was how do you feel the work from home new normal will affect our energy use. Go further uh, towards midday peak use. Yeah, so it's really interesting. If you look at the duck curve or sort of the energy profile that we're, we've been accustomed to, um, we sort of see this um, crazy time from four to 9 p.m. And that was the time when all of us were going home and turning everything on. Um, right now, our the load profile is super wonky uh, because so many people, are, one, aren't working. There's a good portion of the population that can't work um, remotely. Um, so there's actually quite a bit of energy um, use drop. Um, how this becomes the new normal, I don't know, uh, or how, how extensive that is. 
I will say that, again, designing your buildings with flexibility for load management um, works regardless of what the profile is. Uh, so whether it's thermal energy storage or um, battery storage, that load shif shifting capability would allow you to transform your profile to meet the needs of the grid. Uh, so if the grid's not a duck anymore, if it looks more like an alligator or a platypus, whatever the animal that the grid shape starts to look like, if you have a significant amount of energy storage, um, you should be able to match uh, the needs of the grid really well. Okay. Turning to uh, our question and answers, I can see that we have 17 and we, we're going to have, we have about 10 more minutes, but I'm not sure we'll get through 17 of them. So again, fast. I will, I will uh, reemphasize that if we don't get to your question, we will try to get to it after the, uh, and, and get it out there. So yeah. the first question is, we are grateful that uh, administrative initiatives are lighting a fire under various jurisdictions and recognize that achieving carbon neutrality even by 2045 is a push, but we also know that many of these changes should occur in the next 10 years based on the 2030 challenge and other available research. What can we do in our practices to speed this process up other than all the good project practices you have already discussed? I would say, honestly, the, the, if you want to have the biggest climate impact from an architectural or engineering standpoint in the built environment, the most important thing that you can do is renovate existing buildings. So if you look at, we have millions and millions of square feet of existing building stock that are huge carbon emitters. Um, they're not efficient. They burn fossil fuels to heat. If you want to make a push, don't build a new net zero energy building because you're still adding carbon. You still have all that embodied carbon that you're adding. If you want in the next 10 years, in the next 10 years are what really matters. Um, if you want to make the biggest impact in the next 10 years, talk to your clients about renovations. Is the building that they actually currently have, could you, I know renovations are not sexy, they are hard, they're messy, you got to be in the weeds. But if you want the biggest impact, we don't want to add embodied carbon and we want to reduce our operating carbon. So the biggest thing that you can do right now is convince a client that renovating an existing building is the best path forward um, and making that new, making that building net zero energy or net positive, make it a carbon sequester. <laughs> I'd be really excited about that. Well, thank you for that. That makes us, uh, all of us on the uh, XCOM feel very happy because our new offices in Sacramento are going into an 85 year old building that is Perfect. being, uh, that is just finishing its renovation and is totally electrified. Uh, the next question comes from Rona Rothenberg, the overview design development flow diagram and modeling source list and background are very informative. Thank you. What seems to be missing, at least in my reading, in the decision-making flow matrix for integral building and energy system design are the first and life cycle cost analysis milestones. And, and uh, an architect for the owner and government, that's what she is, and industry over my career, even on large complex projects, we, we often had uh, uh, to prompt the A&E team to provide the appropriate cost benefit options early in the design development process for the whole building design for high performance integrated building systems. This is, a crit this is critical to enable institutional design makers, decision makers, to make uh, and defend early incremental decisions about first uh, versus operating cost, uh, first cost versus operating cost before the clients were committed to a certain design direction. So how and where do you do this in your modeling process for the whole building design? That's a really great question. Yeah, that's that's a really great question. Um, so, um, typically, we are doing sort of our life cycle cost assessment um, in schematic design. Um, usually, by the end of schematic design or in the middle of schematic design, we usually have three or four major decisions to make around system selection, and we um, uh, we typically will do our uh, what we call a full life cycle. Um, assessment there where we're looking at operating energy costs, uh, maintenance costs, and initial costs, especially if we are able to not just get a cost est estimator on the project, but also get a contractor who can give us a little bit more closer read to the road on where um, first cost is landing. I will say that more importantly for us right now is in parallel with that in schematic design, we're also doing 
our carbon assessment. So we're trying to actually put, even though there's not a really great price on carbon, we're trying to actually put um, a, a carbon assessment along with those decisions so that we're not just making first cost decisions, which are what got us into this trouble to begin with. There's lots of things cheaper than doing the right decision. Um, but looking at the full impacts, either from carbon, operating cost, um, operating efficiency. Um, and then when we're doing our um, Homer modeling, you can actually put a, do a sensitivity run on utility cost. So that's the other piece that most folks aren't doing in their life cycle cost assessments. It's putting a sensitivity to utility cost because sometimes there's a better um, system that will make you less uh, reactive or impacted by rapid rise in costs. And I can tell you that natural gas prices in about four years are going to skyrocket in the state of California because of the massive infrastructure upgrades that they're going to have to do. Okay, our next question is uh, from Eric Coldera. Uh, for climate analysis, do you have suggestions for finding microclimate data? Oof, that's a, that's a good one. Um, I don't have a great solution. Uh, I can tell you some things that we've, I've done um, which were crazy. So um, microdata, um, I, we often will try to find a weather station that's operated by a university or a research group that's really close to the site. If you're using it, if you have a university client, perfect. They almost always have a science department that has a really good weather station. So we can take that data and actually look at how closely it tracks to the airport that, that the TMY files coming from. And we do sometimes a little post-processing of our TMY file um, to sort of, if you will, fake it till you make it, to make it uh, read closer to um, what a the local weather station will be. But it's not a great process. And we would typically only um, do it if we were really extreme um, and super far away uh, from uh, one of the sort of uh, regular field stations. Yeah. Okay, next question is from Lori Barlow. California government hasn't actually followed its own policies. Oil production and fracking have proceeded untaxed under Jerry Brown and Gavin Newsom. How can our profession push back? And she also put a, a link there, which I can't, I'm not gonna be able to read that out, but anyway, there's yeah. a question. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can act out. Um, I would, so for instance, for, I um, fully believe that electrification and decarbonization of our grid needs to happen yesterday, um, which is why I'm volunteering and helping local cities enact new codes, um, because that's gonna bring the bottom up. Um, getting gas bans today is legal, um, it's effective and it's cost effective. Um, so being a great advocate in your local community um, has a huge uh, benefit. If you need resources to do that, um, find a way to email me um, and I can share the resources. There's a huge community here in Northern California around the Bay Area that we are all sharing resources so that we can all go into city council meetings and be advocates. So lobby the government, lobby the AIA when they're lobbying the government um, and do some feet on the ground work. If you're super passionate about it, city councils are hungry for professionals and experts that will come and, and guide them through this. Um, so I'd encourage you to be an advocate. Okay. We have 20 open questions still, <laughs> and yet it is 12.59. So uh, I will say, well, re-emphasize again, that for those, those questions, we will uh, labor to uh, provide additional resources and maybe answers on the Climate Action Webinar site, okay? So sorry we didn't get to them all today, but we certainly couldn't get to 21 more now. Uh, there were 100 and more than 160 people in this webinar. So now if you've made it this far, we'll uh, submit you for AIA HSW credit. It should appear on your transcript within two weeks. We will be sending out both uh, Stet's slide deck and additional recommended resources tomorrow. A copy of the recorded recording will also be made avail available shortly thereafter as well. Thank you again to our partners, Solar Skyrise, AIA, California, and will be hosting the next live demonstration of their new software platform on Thursday, May 7th at 12 p.m. Details and registration information will be included in your follow-up email as well. Thank you, Stet. Yeah, thanks everyone. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> okay.